When we moved to Amsterdam in 2018, the municipal elections had just finished. One of the political parties is GroenLinks, basically the local Green Party. As part of their election platform, they promised to remove 10,000 parking spaces from the streets of Amsterdam by 2025. But of course, when the election was held, they won a landslide victory. Well, as much of a landslide as you can have in an election with over a dozen parties. They're the light green on this map. This was quite a difference for us, having just moved from a city where a major election promise was to spend about half of the entire transportation services budget, over $3.6 billion, to rebuild a single 1960s elevated expressway through downtown. Well, the rest of the roads looked like this. Car infrastructure is horrendously expensive. But anyway, election promises are one thing. What's the reality? Did Amsterdam really remove thousands of parking spaces? Well, yes, they did. And it's pretty great. Well, mostly. I followed urban planning issues across many cities for many years, and one of the things that's almost universal is that removing parking is contentious. After the motorific 20th century, car owners are very, very, very entitled and feel that they're owed cheap or even free parking everywhere they go. But parking generates a lot of problems too, so many cities are trying to reduce it. That's easier said than done though, and as the saying goes, when you're accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. And boy are drivers ever privileged, even in Amsterdam. Look at a typical street like this one. In Amsterdam, only about 40% of households have a car, but you'd never know it by looking at this. Almost every street is lined with parked cars, which means that a minority of people are consuming a majority of the public space space that could be used for more productive purposes. Unfortunately, street parking brings with it a lot of problems. Besides being ugly and taking up too much space, street parking can be dangerous too. A line of parked cars reduces the visibility of side streets leading to predictable crashes, and cars coming out of parking spaces results in an increase in crashes too. And anyone cycling along a street like this is at risk of serious injury or even death if any one of these drivers opens their car door without looking. Drivers getting in and out of parking spaces also disrupt traffic, which worsens congestion on the street. On commercial streets, it's often argued that street parking is necessary for businesses, but the math doesn't really add up. There's only space for one or two cars outside of most shops, and even if these spots are turning over every 30 minutes or so, which they're not, there's no way this can bring in enough revenue to make a substantial difference to most businesses. City Beautiful made an excellent video recently where he talks, among other things, about the revenue potential of commercial street parking spaces. In most cases, replacing street parking within a city with, say, a protected bicycle lane is almost always better financially. For example, during COVID, Toronto converted many of its street parking spaces into extra restaurant seating, and a recent analysis showed those patios brought in almost 50 times as much money as the parking fees they replaced. Another problem with street parking is that it's usually far too cheap, so it gets occupied quickly. There have been studies showing that in some neighborhoods, 30 to 40% of all traffic was just drivers cruising to find cheap street parking. To deal with this, you'd ideally want to increase the cost of street parking to match demand, and San Francisco tried this with their SF Park experiment, which automatically changed the price of street parking to maintain a 60 to 80% occupancy rate. This experiment worked brilliantly and was beneficial in almost every way, but drivers complained about the uncertainty of how much it would cost to park. And that's in addition to the typical whinging about price from entitled drivers, but we already knew that would happen. So a flat rate is generally more accepted, and here in Amsterdam, street parking prices were increased across the city. For example, it now costs €7.50 per hour to park in the city centre. But that doesn't really get rid of the parking spaces, it just reduces their demand. In most cities, street parking is just an accepted reality. We have come to expect that almost every street is lined with parked cars. But does it really have to be this way? Japanese cities took a very different approach. Here in Tokyo, for example, there is very limited street parking, and the maximum time is usually only one hour or less. 
Most importantly, it's forbidden to park your car on the street overnight. Japan also has a proof of parking rule. If you want to buy a car, you need to prove that you have an off-street parking space for it in order to get it licensed. This is why Japanese streets look the way they do. They can get away with much narrower streets because there's no need to accommodate car parking. On a street like this, all traffic can mix together because speeds are so slow here. This is also why so many people ride bicycles in Japan despite there being very little bicycle infrastructure. These slow, narrow streets are already safe enough for many people. But come on guys, you gotta do better on big roads like this. So removing street parking can significantly improve the look and feel of a city and makes it easier to build great urban places. Of course, whenever a proposal is made to reduce car parking, many people start listing off a long list of reasons why street parking is absolutely essential and can never be removed. But let's be honest, most of the time this is just concern trolling. The people making these arguments don't actually care about the reasons they cite, they just want to keep every possible parking space. But they know saying that out loud makes them sound like an entitled jerk. But there are legitimate reasons to park a motor vehicle sometimes, and Amsterdam has exceptions for many of these cases. For example, on a street like this, there are designated spots for loading and unloading, and despite the picture showing a truck, you can park your personal vehicle here too, you know, for that one time of year you actually use all that space in your SUV. There are also spots for car share cars, which are great and becoming increasingly popular in Amsterdam, and I talked about that in a previous video. There are also shared cargo bikes like this one, which I like even more because so many trips that people think require a car can be done quite easily with a cargo bike. And there are some designated spots for disabled parking too, though Amsterdam also does a lot to ensure that people with physical disabilities can get around in other ways, which can increase their independent mobility. Because what most people fail to acknowledge is that a huge percentage of the disabled population can't drive. So after taking all of this into account, this is what it looks like. This shows that it is possible to cover the corner cases needed for car parking without having to line every street with ugly metal boxes. By now you may be thinking, how did Amsterdam actually pull this off? Did they just dump all the cars into a canal and call it a day? Well, no, not exactly. They've actually tested several methods in different parts of the city. The most common method is attrition. Every street parking space requires a permit, so as people give up their parking permits, for example because they've sold their car or moved out of the city, the city just doesn't grant a new permit. So over time, the problem just works itself out. So that frees up around a thousand parking spaces per year, but that's not quite fast enough, so Amsterdam is trying other methods of speeding up the process. For example, Amsterdam is taking advantage of street redesigns in order to remove parking spaces. This is Koninginnenweg, a relatively busy street in Amsterdam South. When this construction is completed, it will be much safer, especially for people cycling, and it will be reconstructed with around 140 fewer parking spaces. And I featured this street, Kinkerstraat, in my Most Dangerous Places to Cycle in Amsterdam video. This redesign will provide much more room for people cycling and will also remove 27 parking spaces in the process. There are many other construction projects underway across the city and, wherever possible, the street is rebuilt with fewer parking spaces than before. In other cases, cars have been removed for practical reasons. The center of Amsterdam has a lot of canals, and some of these canal walls are hundreds of years old. This has caused a maintenance nightmare, with many walls at risk of collapse. There is a huge maintenance backlog, but one way of extending the life of a canal wall is to remove the heavy stuff from on top of it, and the best way to do that is to remove street parking. There are several places where street parking has been removed along canals, and there is a long-term goal of removing all car parking along canals throughout the city centre. This will certainly improve the look of these places, but it will also provide more space for walking and cycling. This is out of all, which literally just means old wall. A really clever name there, guys. All street parking has been removed along the canal here. Presumably, this will be redesigned in the future, but in the meantime, residents have installed their own planters and decorations. I love seeing this parking payment machine stranded here. And here is an electric car charger no longer accessible for charging. I wonder what they'll do with this. So this gets rid of a few more parking spaces, but it's still not enough to get to 10,000 spaces, so the city is trying other methods of removing parking more quickly. 
One trial was attempted on this street in Amsterdam Oost. In 2019, all of the parking was removed and there were temporary planters and bike parking installed. The idea here is that residents would love the new street so much they wouldn't want the cars to return. For some streets, this can work, but it needs the buy-in from the majority of residents. For now, the trial is over and this street is back to the way it was before. That doesn't mean that it was a failure though, it's just the end of the trial. There are plans in the works for a redesign of this neighborhood, so maybe that'll have to be a future video. Another method was attempted here in the streets along the Franz Hallstraat in De Pipe. Here, street parking was removed in the whole neighborhood all at once. The space was used for more trees and greenery, lots of bicycle parking, small playgrounds, and other uses. This current design is temporary, but plans are moving ahead for a permanent design, and I'll definitely cover this in a future video when this work completes. The result of this transformation is incredible. Look at this street. It feels busy and claustrophobic. Now compare it to this. This street looks large and inviting. But this is exactly the same street, only a few meters away. I've come through here dozens of times, but it never ceases to amaze me. What an incredible difference it makes to get rid of the cars. So where do the cars go? Well, they're right here. No, not in the water. God, that's good B-roll. A multi-level parking garage was built under this canal that has space for all the removed cars, and then some. This is a pretty great parking garage, and it has a huge number of electric car charging spots as well, which makes me wonder just how much electrical current this garage would pull if all of these spots were in use at once. There is bike parking too, but only space for 60 bicycles. It's clear that residents are expected to park their bicycles in the space freed up on the street. So this is great, right? The streets are so obviously better, and this is now one of my favorite neighborhoods in the city. 300 parking spaces were removed to make these streets as great as they are. But this parking garage has space for 600 cars. And it costs 35 million euros, which is almost 60,000 euros per spot. But the residents who live nearby can get a parking space in this garage for the same cost as regular street parking. That's a pretty big subsidy to drivers. As a point of reference, Amsterdam only spends about 70 million per year on bicycle infrastructure, so this one parking garage is equivalent to half the entire cycling budget for a whole year. As usual, car infrastructure is horrendously expensive. But back to the topic at hand. If 300 parking spaces were removed on the street, but 600 were added in the garage, does this count as removing 300 spaces or adding 300 spaces? Well, it turns out the goal of removing 10,000 parking spaces is only referring to on-street parking spaces, so this still counts as 300 removed spaces. Now, don't get me wrong, this is still a really great goal. There are many good reasons for removing on-street parking, and the less of it we have in our cities, the better. But off-street parking causes a lot of problems for cities too. Actually, Climate Town has a great video about this. Uh, you want to comment on that, Rolly? Hey, it's done. The video's all done. I nailed it. Uh, check it out on the Climate Town YouTube page. Back to you, Jason. Anyway, the biggest issue here is that the more parking you have, the more driving you have. And I've heard anecdotally that people in this neighborhood are now more likely to drive because of this parking garage. Before the garage was built, the limited parking on street would discourage people from taking their car as they might not be guaranteed a good spot when they returned. But now that the garage has been built, people are more likely to take their car even for short trips. One fundamental problem with Amsterdam is that the city center is just not good. Yes, I know it's crawling with tourists and has too many waffle shops, and waffles aren't even Dutch, people, but that's not what I'm talking about. If you look at almost any other city in the Netherlands or even Germany, the city center has a pedestrianized area. Heck, Brussels, which is a place I try to forget I lived in, has significantly expanded their pedestrianized city center in recent years. Unfortunately, Amsterdam only has a handful of pedestrianized streets and cars are allowed pretty much everywhere in the city center. And so every weekend you get this line of cars coming into the 17th century canal ring. If there's one thing I've learned from visiting hundreds of cities around the world, it's that the vast majority of people will take whatever transportation method is the fastest and most convenient. If you make trains the most convenient, then most people will take the train. And if you make cars the most convenient, then most people will drive. 
but as with any rule, there are always exceptions. For example, there are some people who will choose to ride a bicycle, even though that's a completely illogical and even dangerous thing to do because the roads were not designed for it. And similarly, there are some people who, no matter how painful and inconvenient it is, will insist on driving, even though the city center is not designed for it. Unfortunately, the people who insist on driving create a lot of problems for everyone else because they take up a huge amount of space and make the streets more dangerous for everybody who isn't inside of a metal box. Now, this is about the time the driving apologists will chime in claiming that all of these people have to drive because they have no other choice and need a car for some reason. Thankfully, the NRC actually stopped and asked people why they were driving into the city center. Were they all bringing their poor disabled mothers out to the canals for a sunny Sunday? No. They were just driving because that's what they felt like doing. One group said they were at the Amsterdam Rye Convention Center, a place with one of the best park and ride garages in the entire city, and a direct metro line that literally brings you right to this location within five minutes. Instead, they sat in traffic for an hour and a half to get here. There was only one guy they interviewed who really needed to drive because he was helping his son move into a new apartment. Of course, he had to sit in traffic that shouldn't have even been there if these people had just taken the metro like everyone else. Do normal, youngins. The majority of this traffic every weekend comes from people shopping, especially at the Bayenkorf, a high-end department store. And what allows these people to do this is this parking garage, which holds over 400 cars. This is a textbook example of parking generating traffic. As long as this Q Park garage is here, there will be people wanting to use it. Thankfully, Amsterdam is starting to do more to reduce car access to the city center. One block away from this dumpster fire is this street, recently converted into a small park. It even has grassy tram tracks, my favorite. Here's what it looked like before. It's amazing to see what can be done with the huge amount of space normally consumed by cars. There is still some work underway here, but when all the work is done, there will be 77 fewer parking spaces along this street. So far, Amsterdam has removed over 4,000 parking spaces with a few years to go until 2025. As some of these construction projects complete, this number should increase quickly, though time will tell if they reach the original 10,000 target. These changes will make a hugely positive impact on streetscapes all across the city, and while removing street parking is not a full solution, it's still a big step in the right direction. Now the next step, let's turn this ugly thing into housing. And speaking of improving things, I'm happy to introduce this video's sponsor, GiveWell. When you give to a charity, how much impact will your donation actually have? This is a difficult question to answer, and most charities can't tell you how your money will be used or how much good it will accomplish. How do you know what impact your donation is having? If you want to help people living in poverty with evidence-based high-impact charities, I recommend you check out GiveWell. GiveWell spends over 30,000 hours each year researching charitable organizations so that the money can be directed to the highest-impact charities. The best part is that GiveWell's research is available absolutely free. They publish all of their research on their website, no sign-up required, and they allocate your tax-deductible donation to the charity or fund you choose, without taking a cut. Over a hundred thousand donors have already used GiveWell to donate more than one billion dollars, and evidence suggests that these donations will save over 150,000 lives and improve the lives of millions more. I've been very impressed with the quality of the research I've seen from GiveWell, and they've certainly made it easier for me to choose which charities to give to, so I'm happy to promote their work. If you've never donated to GiveWell's recommended charities before, then now is definitely the time, because GiveWell will match your donation up to $100 before the end of the year or as long as matching funds last. To learn more or to make a donation, go to givewell.org slash notjustbikes. I'd also like to thank my supporters on Nebula and Patreon who pay me to film cars, and no cars too. If you'd like to support this channel, visit nebula.tv slash notjustbikes or patreon.com slash notjustbikes.